Hi, welcome everyone to the first webinar for Phenology Week. Uh, we're really glad that you're here. Um, we are recording this webinar and we're going to be sending out the recording to everyone who registered. If you have any questions during the webinar, we'll get to those at the end. So you're welcome to put those in the Q&A and you'll find that on the, the bottom of your Zoom. We also uh, have a chat feature and we'd love for you to tell us where you're calling in from. If you'd like to put anything in there, you can also tell us about anything that's happening phonology wise um, in your part of the country. Uh, I'm gonna be turning it over now to direct Dr. Teresa Crimmins. She is our director of the USA National Phonology Network and also a associate professor in the School of Natural Resources and the Environment here at the University of Arizona. So with that, I'll pass it to you, Teresa. Thank you, Erin, and thanks for joining us today. It is really exciting to be celebrating Phonology Week again, and it's really exciting to be on the eve of the first day of spring. I know it's, I'd love to hear what's going on, where you're at, wherever you're joining us from, um, because I know that it's been another really interesting start to the growing season all across the country this year. Um, <laughs> when we first started carefully tracking where and when spring was start starting and whether it's earlier or late. Um, we only had really what felt like interesting, noteworthy and newsworthy years every two or three or four or five years. And now it's just every year is, is something interesting. And when I say interesting, it's not always good. <laughs> As you're probably aware, there can be pretty significant consequences to activity starting really uh, much earlier than it used to in the past. And so, um, yeah, we never feel bored here at this time of year anymore. Oops. So I'm going to start just by uh, giving you a quick overview of all the really great stuff that Erin and Samantha have planned for this week and McKinsey as well. Um, we have a whole week week's worth of fun and exciting things going on starting with today, this conversation. And then tomorrow, uh, if you're new to Nature's Notebook, there will be a webinar that will be introductory to walk you through how to get started. And then later on tomorrow, there is a webinar focused specifically on one of our observation campaigns, which is called Quercus Quest, which is something that we have been carrying out for a couple of years now in collaboration with researchers all across the country. And it's focused on Quercus, which is oaks. So you can learn all about how to um, oaks are tricky ones, especially for identifying whether their flowers are open or not. So that's one of the things that will be covered in, in that webinar. Then on Thursday, there is a Q&A session with some of our leading local phonology leaders, which are folks that have been participating for, in some cases, many years in coordinating groups of observers at their location. And they've got a, an abundance of useful information to share about how to engage a group and um, what works and what doesn't and what's interesting and why they sustain activity. And we are endlessly grateful to these wonderful individuals that, that dedicate so much time to, to this activity. On Friday, Erin's leading this really cool activity that I'm hoping so much I can join called the Phonology Wheels Paint Along. It's a mashup of art and science where if you bring a paper plate or something round and some art supplies, you can um, she will walk you through the activity of plotting plotting what's happening uh, over the course of the year, the round of the year, um, physically on your round object. And then finally, on Saturday, if you're here in Tucson, Erin uh, and Samantha are hosting a phonology meetup at the Mason Center, which is the Tucson Audubon Society's facility in northwest Tucson, where they track um, nesting in Lucy's warblers and a number of other wonderful things. And it's a chance if you're here local, locally to meet up with other folks who are like-minded and also tracking plant and animal seasonal activity. So if we look at the calendar, tomorrow is officially the first day of spring. And we define that the way that we come about having March, and it varies sometimes, March 19th, March 20th, March 21st, that has everything to do with where the Earth is in relation to the sun as we revolve around the sun each year. And if you remember the science that you learned back in grade school, the Earth rotates on an axis that is at a 23 and a half degree tilt. And because the Earth is, as we move around the sun, sometimes we're tilting toward it, 
um, we have longer days. And when we have those longer days, we also tend to have warmer temperatures. And we, when we are in a position where we are tilting away, where the Northern hemisphere is tilting away from the, from the sun, we have shorter days and um, cooler temperatures. So we are rounding the bend here to where the days are starting to, where, well, the actually what defines, I'm sure you know, the vernal equinox, the start of spring, is where we have exactly the same amount of daylight and darkness. And now once we pass that threshold, the days start getting longer and we'll have more daylight, more daylight than, than darkness um, up until we get to that autumnal equinox. So we use this as an indicator of, yep, things are starting. But do we actually sense it that way? Do we wait to, until the calendar tells us, yes, the earth is in a position around the sun such that we can now say it's the start of spring? Generally, my experience is no. We all actually pay much more attention to events like the migration of the Canada geese back north or the emergence of skunk cabbage. I saw somebody mention skunk, skunk cabbage here in, in the chat or the crocus is peeking out of the snow, or of course, those really iconic cherry blossoms that we're starting to hear an awful lot about in the news. These are actually the signs of spring. And we humans, for as long as humans or humanoids have been on the planet, we have had to actually pay close attention to when these kinds of things are, are happening. And what are the environmental conditions that seem to trigger them? You know, the, the position of the stars as well as the length of the days can tell us an awful lot about where we are in that, that course of the Earth around the sun and when particular events are going to occur. And so for a very long time, indigenous cultures have kept very close track of these things and folded them and woven them throughout their ceremony and culture and, and very life ways of ways of being because it shapes so much so heavily food availability and when to harvest medicines and other materials that are so important. Those of us that are living in modern, modern culture now, we have the luxury of being a little more disconnected from this kind of stuff. We can get in the car and go to the grocery store and buy things out of the refrigerator that maybe aren't in season right now. But if we are living back several centuries ago, or even in a location that's a little more remote, we have to pay a much, much closer attention to when these things occur. And so phonology has really been rooted very deeply um, throughout history, through many cultures, and continues to be so as well. And so some of the adages that we tend to hear about this time of year, often, especially if you look at, say, the farmer's almanac, we might hear things like plant corn when uh, the oak leaves are the size of a squirrel's ear. And that might sound quaint and it might think, seem like a, a good recommendation. There may be some logic behind that. But the truth is so many of those um, recommendations or guidelines actually come from uh, a very deep and rich understanding of the relationships between um, environmental conditions and then plant and animal response. And there have been many, many examples of where that has been documented and where that information is still guiding the timing of activity um, among different groups of people or, or cultures. And so one really cool example from the Pacific Northwest is that um, the bird that many of us recognize as Swainson's thrush is referred to as salmonberry bird. And the reason why it goes by that name in that part of the country or part of the world is because its bird, it, when it sings, is um, indicative of when salmon berries, which are berries I hear are very delicious, they're closely related to raspberries, are ripe. And so that's the time to go out and collect them. In another cool example from the northeast part of the country, part of the US, the Lenape people for many centuries used flowering in a shrub that you might recognize as amelanchier to indicate when shad, which are um, a, a fish that, that has this huge run up the Chesapeake Bay and up the Hudson River are going to be running. And so they would know, keep an eye on that particular shrub. And when that starts flowering, then it's time to go start fishing. Kind of another interesting thing about this shrub though, is that it also goes by the name of service, ver service berry. And the reason for that is that back in the 1700s, 1800s, um, it was indicative of when the earth had um, 
defrosted enough from the winter that it was possible to dig graves to be able to bury the dead who had died during the winter um, and could not be buried. And so it, it's an early season flowering shrub and it's an indicator that the earth is no longer frozen. And so it also got the name service berry. And so kind of related to the um, we, phenology wheel event that Aaron is gonna be doing on Friday, one of the ways that we can kind of think about this continuum of events that are occurring in plants and animals over the course of the year as a function of the changing light conditions that we experience because we're going around the, the sun and all of the changes that we experience as a consequence in air temperature and soil temperature and freezing events and moisture in the air and even precipitation events, um, all of that can be captured in a number of different ways. And in many ways, it can be very multifaceted and very textured. Um, it doesn't just have to be the zeros and ones or yeses and nos of do you see open flowers? And we want to, we here, I guess I want to iterate, reiterate that we really appreciate that. And we recognize that there are so, there, there's so much value beyond the records that we collect about what's happening. I don't want to undermine that message because the records of when things are happening are critically valuable. And that's a, kind of the point of what I'll be demonstrating to you in a couple of studies that were recently published today. However, the experience that is in full, that, that, that data collection is enfolded in is so much richer. And I find it personally to be such a rich experience and it has so much depth and history um, culturally as well in, in so many ways. That said, <laughs> here at the National Phenology Network, it is kind of black and white. Um, we do exist to collect store and share phenology data and information. And so we do, as you know, put an awful lot of emphasis on that activity of going out and looking at your organisms and recording what you are seeing using um, pretty structured protocols that help you identify whether you the organism you are, are observing really does meet the criteria for say ripe fruits or not. <clears throat> And so at this point, we are curious to know who all are we speaking with today? Are you a nature's notebook observer? And so Aaron's got a poll that we're going to launch real quick. And we would love to hear where you fall on this continuum of um, keeping track of what you see when you step outside or even when you just look out the window. I love this. These are all wonderful ways of kind of acknowledging the changes that are occurring from day to day and season to season. And personally, I find that it, it really adds so much context and richness to our experiences, even if you're really busy. Um, for example, um, there's a tree outside our building here on campus that I make observations on, I try to, at least once a week, whenever I come to campus. And it it definitely is just a nice thing to do after I've hustled through the whole morning routine and I battle traffic and then I park and I have to hustle real quick to get to the building. I'm like, there's the blue Palo Verde. Oh, I like this tree. And I take a few moments and I look at it and I see what it's doing. And it's just a nice way to kind of reset my mind before I step in here and start contending with email. <laughs> okay. Erin, are you going to stop it or do I stop it? I'm sorry, I forgot. Yeah, I just shared the results. So we have over oh. half the people on the webinar today are already Nature's Notebook observers. Um, a lot of people also take photos. And then there are a few people that don't track plant and animal seasonal cycles yet. Yet. Okay, we'll see if we can win you over. <laughs> thank you so much for sharing. And thank you to everybody who does keep track of what's happening out there on and plants and animals, however you do it. Because however you're doing it, you are contributing to our broader appreciation of the fact that things do vary over the course of the season and from one year to the next. And that's just such an important baseline for living in, in concert with the rest of the world, honestly, all the other organisms that make up the world. 
And then a special, a special thank you to anyone who has been documenting that and contributing it to Nature's Notebook in particular, because that contributes to a growing data set that is supporting a whole a lot of really important decisions as well as um, fundamental research. And so that's what I'm gonna go over today. Just a little bit more context. I always like to kind of look at the numbers and see where we stand. This is one of my favorite plots that I update periodically. This shows each line represents a year that we have been running the Nature's Notebook program. And the across the x-axis is, is, the, is the, whole, the whole of the year. And so the wiggly line, it's, a, it's called an accumulative curve where we just add however many records are coming in each day. And so the, it just climbs over the course of the year. And so the, the lightest colors, I tried to do it in a, in a color scheme that would make some sort of logical sense. So it's basically reverse rainbow at this point. Red is this year and the, the mutedest colors are the earliest years of the program. And so what you'll see is that the most recent years are among those where the most records have come in. It's a pretty clear pattern that almost every single year that we've run the program, we've had more records coming in. You will notice that um, the last two years, 22 and 23, which are both the two orange colors, are a little lower than the previous years. And that is because something really critical is missing from our database right now. Um, there is a, a sister program of ours that has paid um, staff members out collecting a lot of observations at key sites across the landscape. They're called the part of the National Ecological Observatory Program. And right now we haven't been able to add their data into our database in the last couple of years. But once we do, I know those lines will surpass the other others. And um, I wanted to point out too that so far, that we have a close up of our progress so far this spring. Um, we're in good shape. We are in good shape, and I feel highly confident that we will start to surpass all of the other lines for in terms of contributions in the previous years as well. And so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are really close or may have exceeded now a half a million records coming in so far this year. And that's a lot. <laughs> that is incredible work. Every time, I don't want to get too distracted, but I get so excited when I look at some of this stuff. I was spending a moment with one of our wonderful IT team members last week looking at our website. And it showed that in the past week, over 4,000 people had visited the website. And I was just, my mind was blown to think that there was that many individuals excited about phonology that came to learn something um, in the past week. So this is, this is exciting. And so here's another plot that I just updated that shows where those data are coming in from. Each dot is a, a site that's been located, that's been registered with Nature's Notebook. And then the size of the circle represents how many records have been contributed uh, at any point since 2009 when we launched the program. And apologies to the locations that are outside of the 50 states because some of those have gotten truncated off. We do have some good dedicated observers in locations that aren't actually showing up here, but I kept the focus on the US since that is our focus. But thank you, thank you to every single person who is a dot on, on this map. We are so grateful. So there are, gosh, two way too many ways <laughs> that people use these data um, to ever get through in an hour. But and so I'm just going to focus on three um, recent studies that were that are published earlier in this year. And these are indicative of some of the ways that these data are used. But if you come back, we do these kinds of webinars at least once a year, every year, because there's always something new and interesting to talk about. Um, and it's always exciting, honestly, to see so frequently um, researchers or scientists will learn that we have this data resource available and they will come and access it and do analysis with it. And we will have no idea that that's actually happening until we discover that a paper has been published. And it's so gratifying when that happens because because usually it's ideas that never occurred to any of us. We thought how how exciting and creative and, and fascinating to see that these reports that you all are making are 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 the baseline, the, the bedrock for these kinds of discoveries. So some of the things that I will cover today are some of the, the, the examples I'll show today are, are emblematic of some of the common ways that these data are used, which include predicting the timing of seasonal events, understanding how climate change is affecting 
phenology and species in general. And then using these observations to kind of poke at widely accepted patterns, things that we think we know, do we really know them or do these patterns not hold as well as we thought they did? So the first example is uh, focused more on um, when can we predict when things will happen? And I, this is exactly one of those situations where we're really kind of thinking about things in a mechanistic way rather than that lovely phonology wheel um, progression of lots of events over the course of the year. We're really drilling down and to a particular set of species in a particular location and trying to say what's going to happen here. But that is one of the common ways in which we use this information and it can be very helpful too. So how can we predict when something is going to occur? This gentleman is looking at a creosote bush and he's looking very intently to see if he can see flowers and I don't see any open flowers on that creosote branch. How could we help him understand? How could we help him make a prediction as to when he might see some open flowers on that creosote bush? Basically, a very common way of doing this is to look at what are the conditions that have preceded the dates of first open flower in that particular species in previous years or at other locations. And very often, these predictions can be made pretty much by boiling things down to pre uh, preceding temperature conditions, sunlight or day length conditions, and then sometimes some measure of moisture, either uh, precipitation falling or the soil moisture that that translates to. And so to kind of do this in a qualitative way, this is quite often how this, these sorts of predictions or, or models are constructed. If you have a series of observations made on the same event, and in this case, we're looking at now open flowers on red maple, um, what day did you first experience that event occurring? And what were the conditions associated with that? And so this is very qualitative, but I didn't wanna overwhelm us with a lot of numbers. Um, but as an example, in this, in this made up example, um, for a made up location, I have five years of, of observations where the column on the right is the day of year, meaning um, if you start numbering the days on the calendar, from January 1st as number day one, and January 2nd as day two, and December 31st as day, 100, day 365, or 366 in a year like this, which is a, a, a leap year, then you can, you can have a, a, a sequential numbered day for every day of the calendar. And so in this example, I said that in 1994, we first saw the red maple tree in our fictitious location flowering on day 47. And then in 1995, it was a little earlier. It was day 42. And then day 96, it was a little later, it was day 46. And then 97 and 98, it was much earlier. And, and then we qualitatively estimate what were the spring temperatures that preceded that. And then we could look to see, is there some relationship? Do we see earlier flowering when the temperatures are warmer? Do we see later flowering when the temperatures are colder? And that's effectively what scientists do to try to come up with a model that enables us to then make a prediction. And so if you're familiar with um, any of the pheno forecast map products that we have on our website, we have a number of these for different species where we try to predict whether a particular species is undergoing a particular event, phenological event, based on what those conditions have been like. And so this is an example map from last December where we were trying to predict which locations should be experiencing apple maggot em emergence. And um, that is based on um, how what the temperature conditions had been like in that preceding several months, and then how much warmth we know that those individuals need to be exposed to in order to emerge. So once you, once you establish that relationship, you can make a prediction all across a landscape. If, as long as you have information about, in this case, temperature, which is what we identified as the driving variable. And so a couple of researchers wanted to see, they basically said, okay, this is a really common practice to establish a model, um, a relationship between say temperature and phenological activity, and then predict it across the landscape. But very often those models are built at a single location. 
And then we just assume that they work really well across, say, the whole country, like the previous map I just showed. But is that a safe assumption? And this is actually a really practical question because as you can see, we do this. <laughs> we take models that have been established in some cases at a single location and just assume that they work across the landscape. And so these researchers uh, address this from a couple of different angles. They first ask the question, does it matter, um, does the model performance say vary based on how warm a location is? And so here they were looking at urban versus rural locations. And the reason why they made that distinction is because in general, urban locations are warmer than their rural counterparts. There's a lot of asphalt, which um, will absorb heat from the sun and then re-emit it as radiation. So it just feels warmer. And all of that uh, infrastructure, all of the, the buildings and things also do the same. And the, there's just, there's a lot of retained warmth there. There's also less vegetation usually respiring and, and, and providing that cooling effect. Um, and so you might've heard of urban heat islands because very large urban areas, especially like Phoenix down here, can be several degrees warmer actually than the surrounding landscape. And so their hypothesis was, okay, if we look at the same species, the same tree, we think because it's warmer in urban environments, those trees are gonna be more adapted to that. And so they would actually be need to be exposed to even more warmth in order to um, undergo the transition that, that we are trying to predict compared to more rural locations where there's more um, temperature fluctuation over the course of the day and night. And then they also asked, does it matter across latitude? Another underlying, <laughs> something that we know, scientists know, but don't really account for in a lot of these models is the fact that species do actually adapt to local conditions. Um, when we are looking at individuals of a, the same species, in many cases, um, individuals that are located at higher latitudes require less exposure to warmth in order to say leaf out or flower compared to individuals at the South. And that is because at higher latitudes, say up here in, the, in New England, it's just a shorter growing season. Um, and those plants need to be paying attention because they need to be able to fit in their whole life cycle um, from leaf out and flowering and fruit production and then seed ripening before they run out of um, season, basically before it gets too cold again. And so their, their second prediction was, okay, we're gonna see um, a, a, a variation among individuals from higher or lower latitudes too. And so the models won't fit, they won't work as well. If a model is established at high latitude, it shouldn't work as well for predicting individuals at low latitude and vice versa. And so what they did was they had observations collected both by this fabulous group of individuals called the Arnold Arboretum tree spotters, who are, at, who are um, volunteers that very diligently made observations using nature's notebook in 15 different species of woody plants at the Arnold Arboretum, which is located there, you can see in Boston at Harvard University. And then they also had observations collected at the Harvard Forest, which was further west and more inland. And even though they only had observations collected in these two locations, the individual trees that they were observing at Arnold Arboretum were actually individuals that had been sourced from different um, latitudes at different locations, because oftentimes uh, arboreta are kind of like tree collections. And so they did have um, individuals whose uh, lineage they could trace to other locations. So the Arnold Arboretum tree spotters collected from between 2015 and 2020, over 300,000 records of plant phenology across 200, uh, 227 individual people. And so it was this wonderful data set, wonderful data resource for the researchers to be able to work with and try to test these um, hypotheses. And basically what they found was the inverse of what they expected regarding the urban versus rural, where the individual trees that were located in more urban environments actually responded less, they needed less, they responded more. They were more sensitive to temperature and they needed less exposure to temperature in order to start leafing out or flowering than their rural counterparts, which was a surprise. And the authors of the study weren't really quite sure why that might be. 
But the prevailing thought on this right now is it probably has something to do with artificial light. And you may have seen, especially if you've attended webinars or followed our work from previous years, there has been some work recently from some other collaborating researchers that have used nature's notebook observations that have showed that, yeah, actually artificial light plays a pretty big role in helping govern when plants undergo seasonal transitions. It tends to lead to earlier leaf out in the spring and later leaf drop in the fall. Um, basically, we're just kind of messing with, <laughs> we're messing with the environment with by pumping all of this additional um, artificial light into the sky. And then when it comes to their second question about latitude, they didn't find a strong pattern. And so these were these were perhaps surprising and interesting findings. Um, one of the important takeaways was that the what they did find was that depending on um, how the models were being applied across environments, they could have error of up to 20%, which sounds huge, but actually, I tried to do the math and as far as I could tell, that actually translates to only maybe a few days error in prediction. So basically what they're saying is a model might predict that the tree would leaf out in a particular location, say on March 1st, where in reality it March leafs out in March on March 3rd. Honestly, <laughs> that's definitely within the range of error that we see in, in these kinds of predictive models anyway. And so it, I think isn't truly that big of a difference, honestly, and nothing that we need to be too upset about. So honestly, it was a relief to me because I felt like, okay, this is a small study, but it seems to suggest so far that yes, we know that the kinds of models that we uh, operationalize, that we, that we use to predict across the whole landscape probably have error in them, but it's not so much error to make our predictions invalid. It really is something I feel like I can tolerate. <laughs> um, the second interesting thing that they noted was that they saw the worst performance in the model with, the, with warmer temperatures. And so the prediction here is that as the globe increases in temperature, we may see the performance of these predictions degrade a little bit more. I still don't think it's out of the realm of what we can work with, um, but that, it, that was something to note. Okay, shifting gears to a different study. Um, as the climate changes and we start to experience warmer temperatures um, and fewer cold days, fewer, less, less chilling temperatures, um, less snow, uh, what is the impact on plants and their ability to complete their entire life cycle within a season and persist? It's probably gonna vary by species, but the kinds of observations that we are getting through Nature's Notebook from awesome folks like yourself are helping researchers better understand this. So this is this is another, I thought this was such a fascinating study. Um, in, in this study, the researchers focused on something called dioecious plants. And dioecious means that there are separate individual plants that have either only male flowers or female flowers. You might not have thought about this very much before, but if you open up a flower, you will see perhaps a whole lot of different things. And usually you will see a whole lot of different things because the most common um, structure, the most common configuration for flowers is both the female parts, which are typically the pistil, which is the kind of thick solid thing sticking up through the middle. And then the male parts, which are the anthers that are spindlier and typically have um, all the pollen out around the edges. Gets complicated because sometimes plants can just self, which means they self pollinate. We just get that pollen from those anthers up into the pistil, down into the ovary, and then you're good to go. You have a fertilized plant, fertilized flower. Oftentimes, typically you need pollen exchange among individual plants. Sometimes you have separate male and female plant, excuse me, separate and female flowers, but still on the same plant. And then in about 5% of flowering plant species, we have this situation where they are truly distinct male and female individuals. And so what we're, that's most common among ashes, mulberries, willows, uh, and cottonwood or poplar like we're seeing here. And 
Another thing you might note is that these are some of those kinds of flowers that are not very showy. And that is because they are wind pollinated. Dioecious, dioecy, dioecy, um, where they're truly distinct individuals is most common among wind pollinated plants. And um, because in those plants, they are relying on the power of the wind to move the pollen from the male flowers to the female flowers, they're not looking for pollinators. They're not trying to attract bees or butterflies or any other pollinator. So they don't bother putting energy into making the flower look pretty or having a pretty scent or anything that would be attractive. They're just like, make a whole lot of pollen and pump it out there so that it can get on the wind and travel and reach the female flowers. So what? <laughs> so what? Actually, diacy and phonology intersect in two really important ways. First of all, you can only have reproductive success if the male and the female trees or individuals are flowering at the same time. You need for the males to be producing that pollen and having it ripening and then being dispersed and getting on the wind currents at the same time that you have the female flowers ripe and ready to receive that pollen so that they could, you know, once it gets to the female flower, it's fertilized and then can, can develop into a fruit. If you don't have that timing synced up, you're not gonna have any luck. And then the second thing is, is again, because we're relying on that wind, we really wanna, trees really wanna optimize that and reduce the um, potential for interaction or, or obstruction by leaves. And so quite often these plants that undergo this particular approach for fertilization will flower before they leaf out. And ideally they complete their, their fertilization before the leaves get very big because once you get start getting a bunch of leaves on the trees, then that's just much harder for the pollen to make it into the female flowers. And so a research team chose to look at this because whether any of those things are changing is something we don't know. Um, we, what we do know is that with climate change, with warmer temperatures, I'm going to speak in broad brush, broad brush strokes here, but in general, when we, we are generally seeing much warmer spring temperatures, when we see warmer spring temperatures, we tend to see activity advancing. We see um, flowering coming earlier, we see leaf out coming earlier, but it's super not consistent across species or locations or even from one year to the next. That's just like the long-term course patterns. And we really don't know how it plays out with these trees that have separate male and female individuals. So these researchers said, let's see if we can see, does it, what are we seeing? Are we starting to see any changes that might negatively or positively affect these, these species? And so they first asked the question, is the flowering in the male and the female flowers becoming less synchronized? Are they becoming disjointed in time? Or are they, you know, if one is, if one is shifting earlier, is the other also shifting earlier? Oh yeah, I forgot to make cool animations. <laughs> and then secondly, are the leafing and flowering becoming more synchronized? Which would be a bad thing because if they were becoming more um, synchronized, then that would mean you'd have more uh, interference potentially by the leaves for the pollen trying to reach the, the female flowers. And so what this research team did was they used nature's notebook observations of um, the leaves and the open flower timing for, they focused specifically on populace, which is poplar or cottonwood. And they looked at eight different species. They used as much of the data from nature's notebook that they could from, and it spanned 2009 to 2021. But that's not really, it seems like a really long time. It's a very long time to be collecting data if you're the one out there making all those observations. And if you did, again, I thank you. When it comes to looking at trends like this, you actually really need a much longer time frame. And so to supplement that, what they what they drew, drew from were herbarium specimens, which are plant samples that have been collected in the past and then pressed and dried and are preserved. And in many cases are now being digitized, so are now available um, through databases and can be analyzed. And so what those, both the herbarium specimens and the nature's notebook specimens or observations can tell us is each of these dots is a tree. It's, a, it's an observation in one of those years. And we know in that location in that year, when did the male or the female tree flower? Um, and when did it leaf out? 
And we use that to basically answer those questions that they posed. And so what they found was, first of all, male trees do start flowering before female trees. That's just a pattern. And I think we already knew that going into this. But what they found was that consistent with what we already actually have established in the literature, generally species that undergo their leaf or flowering earlier in the season, they tend to be the ones that are the more sensitive. And so they tend to be the ones that are showing the greater advancements, meaning um, shifting that activity even earlier in the season. Stuff that undergoes transitions later in the season doesn't always show um, advancements. And if it does, it's not necessarily as large of an advancement. So the fact that the male trees flower earlier, that is, is um, it's not surprising that they actually are showing greater advancements. That's not exactly good news though, because if we are seeing the male trees shift earlier and the female trees not shifting earlier at the same rate, we will start to see, we are starting to see a bit of a temporal mismatch emerging there. We also know that the trees flower before they leaf out. And so following that same logic then, the flowering is more sensitive to temperature than the leaf out. Um, and that's again, consistent with that pattern. The earlier season stuff is showing the greater shifts earlier. Um, and that's actually kind of good news. It means that we're seeing a bigger window now where the trees have flowers open without the leaves in there interfering with the pollen um, dispersal. So it's a mixed story there and it's tough to know what, you know, how it's going to actually play out because there's a lot of other factors to the story, a lot of other pieces to the puzzle, but that that is a novel story, honestly, made possible because of the observations that are coming in through Nature's Notebook. Okay, one more fun little example, and I like this one because this is one I had the pleasure of working on with a fabulous individual based at the Wells Reserve in Maine, uh, who was pursuing a master's degree and wanted to do a project using some of the phenology data that she has been collecting uh, with others on her uh, study site there at the Wells Reserve for several years. And so this falls under the umbrella of, can we use Nature's Notebook data to kind of test whether patterns or um, uh, just uh, the things that people assume are true and that we've all kind of like agreed on and go along with are actually still true. And so she came to, she brought this really compelling question, I thought of, do plants always undergo transitions in the same sequence? In general, they do. And if you're keeping track, I'm sure you're aware, you know, we definitely see birches flowering and leafing out before we see oaks leafing out. Um, here in my yard, we absolutely see de desert willows leafing out before many of the cacti start to flower. But it's not, it's not always true. It's not always true. And I love this little adage that you might uh, be familiar with, kind of hearkening back to the beginning of the talk. If oak comes before ash, we're in for a splash. If ash comes before oak, then we're in for a soak. And so this is sort of, this is suggesting that we can use trees to predict the weather. I am not sure I buy that part, but the fact that we're even talking about the uh, um, a difference between the sequence in ash and oak suggests that yes, the things don't always go in the exact same sequence. And so we basically, she basically brought that question forward of how how consistently do things undergo their transitions from one year to the next, and so. Here's a screen cap of what that, how that might play out. And so these are actually real observations from a participant in Nature's Notebook. And the dots represent the, the day of year that that individual first reported, I think this is flowering, open flowers in the blue line, bluish green line is Arnold red honeysuckle. And the red line is the red Rotha magensis lilac. And so the x-axis is the year. So these are observations that this individual has very diligently reported every year. And the y-axis is that day of year. So again, recall that um, that's representing the sequential day in the whole 
day, the whole 365 year days in the year. And so day 100 is around April 10th, I think, somewhere right around there. And so the important things that we see here are first, that there's a lot of variability from one year to the next. 2012, we saw very early activity. I wish I would have labeled. I don't remember if this is leaf powder flowering. And then the next year, 2013, we saw it was really quite late. 2014, again, late. 2016, really early. 2019, really late. 2018, I guess, is late, relatively late. And then the other thing that we notice is these lines never cross. And that means then that the Arnold red honeysuckle always underwent its transition prior to the lilac. You can see that sometimes they were almost on the same day. Sometimes they were separated by several weeks, but they always went in the same sequence. And so that was the question that Karen brought to the study was how often do we see this? And we basically decided, let's let's look. Let's let's just look at the whole of the Nature's Notebook database and see what is that, we called it consistency. What's the consistency in under which species undergo these transitions um, in the same sequence every year? And so we looked at all of the breaking leaf beds and open flower observations for as many species as we could get for at that time, 2009 through 2022. And then we ended up filtering it down to sites with at least five years of data um, for at least two species, I think, and these maps show the distribution of those observations. And so um, the left is leaf out and the right is flowering. It's not broken down by species, but if, if you happen to be contributing data from a site that looks like it's on the map there, then that's probably your data that we ended up using. And just very quickly, some of the results are, we'll share them here. This is, this is the, the sum, a very small capture of the leaf out for a couple of the sites. And what you can see is, in reality, sometimes you have, excuse me, um, very consistent, um, always in the same sequence, the lines never crossing. But then sometimes it's messy. <laughs> and honestly, it was messier, more messy than I thought it would be. And we worked very hard to make sure that we culled out questionable data, things that we weren't sure, you know, we're an outlier or not. And even still, things didn't always behave the way we thought that they would, which would be these perfectly parallel lines, um, which is what the literature had told us we would see. Um, when we look at flowering, things got a little cleaner. Um, by and large, flowering occurs later in the season than leaf out. And generally, conditions kind of settle down, meaning earlier in this in the growing season, you probably are aware, <laughs> you might flip between a spring jacket or even no coat and then your parka from one day to the next. And then eventually, as you get a little later in the spring, it's a lot more consistent. It's just warmer. And plants that undergo transitions later in the season when things are more consistent, they just are more predictable. And so generally the flowering, which generally happens later, was more predictable. And so the answer to our question was, it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 80% things actually occurred in the same sequence. Um, it was definitely a higher for the flowering than for the leaf out. What we definitely saw was the temporal spacing matters. This is a total no brainer, but if two events occur very close in time, then they were more likely to get um, swapped from one year to the next in terms of the sequence. And if they were spread apart by a couple of weeks or even longer, then they were far less likely to become interrupted um, from one year to the next, kind of obvious. Uh, we did look to see, did it matter whether we were talking about trees or shrubs or forbs or whether it was earlier in the season or later in the season? And we didn't really see super clear patterns emerge there. Um, and which species if we were looking at the same two species, whether they underwent the same, they under, whether they underwent their, their transitions in the same sequence varied from one location to another. So at one location, they may be very consistent, always parallel lines. And then in a different state, it might be a totally different story. So we thought that was kind of interesting. We don't really know why that is, but again, it probably has something to do with local adaptation, which again is where individuals from in the same species 
are sensitive to slightly different conditions depending on where they're located. If you're interested in learning more, we about every other month will do a write-up of a study that has used our data. And you can find that on our website. If you look at this What's Happening tab here, if you click that, it will take you to a um, section that is the news and publications. And these, these ones that are tabbed or tagged publication summary are the write-ups that explain that. And so we have a brand new one on there that actually summarizes the middle study that I talked about today, the one where we looked at Daisy, the male and the female trees. And so you can check those uh, fr frequently. I think we have maybe now a couple hundred of them on here. So they're, they can be a really nice resource for seeing what we've covered in the past, who has used our data and how in the past, and actually teachers use these as resources fairly regularly too. Um, and if you, if you uh, uh, subscribe to our newsletters, you can definitely learn about them in there as well. A quick shout out for what's coming this year. If you haven't seen it, we have a new website and we're very, 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 very excited about the new website. And we are still making finishing touches on some of the features there. And we do have some additional features and improvements planned that we hope to get to in the coming months this year. So stay tuned for that. And again, we will share those updates as things go live through our website, or excuse me, through the, the newsletters. And then if you're familiar again with those you know, forecasts, those maps that indicate when things are likely to be occurring in real time across the country, we have a couple more on the way. One for spotted, spotted lanternfly, which I know there's a lot of enthusiasm about because that, that is the rather beautiful but really problematic insect that's been getting an awful lot of attention as of late. And then we we currently have one for Asian longhorned beetle, which is another really problematic beetle. Uh, we're expanding it further south because unfortunately that really problematic pest is spreading as well. And so these maps can be used to indicate where you might be likely to see them and hopefully be able to undertake control measures. We welcome you to stay in touch. We are on social media, although it's kind of in flux because we used to use Twitter a lot and now we don't use Twitter so much. So um, we have a really great growing Instagram presence. I'm trying out Blue Sky. Of course, we're on Facebook. Definitely check out our newsletters because we really do put effort into putting great content in there as well as campaign messages. And please be sure to check out the remaining fun stuff at, that, that we have planned for the rest of Phenology Week. I think that's it. I just otherwise want to say thank you again. And I appreciate you. And I'm happy to answer, try to answer questions since I did leave a few minutes at the end here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Teresa, for sharing those papers. Um, I put a whole bunch of links in the chat. So if anyone wants to sign up for newsletters or the Fino forecasts, I'll put the the Phenology Week website in there again, in case you want to sign up for any of our other webinars. Um, as Teresa mentioned, we have a couple tomorrow, one on Thursday and one on Friday. Uh, we don't have any questions yet, but there's still time. If anyone wants to post any questions, you can put them in either the chat or the Q&A. Um, but did want to give a shout out that we do have the, um, the tree spotters represented on the webinar today. So, um, it was great to be able to share some of the, the outcomes from all the data that you collected for so many years. So we really appreciate you. And thanks for the clarification too. I, I appreciate it. I'm so glad that you all have been able to persist because it is such a valuable data set. And I know that there's other work underway trying to interrogate those data in other ways too. Yeah, and Beth actually asked in the Q&A, um, is it possible to reverse search to see who is using our data? Oh, I <laughs> wish, I wish, I wish, I wish I had a better answer for that. We have been trying. I've spent uh, a decent amount of time trying to figure out a way to close that loop. It's really difficult because, first of all, we don't require anyone to register when they download any amount of the data. We try to make it easy access and, and try to reduce those barriers as much as possible. 
And then I can definitely say from personal experience, when I use the data too, you end up downloading it and then you end up filtering and manipulating and filtering further. And so what you end up using in the final results are usually a much smaller version of what was originally downloaded. And so um, it's very hard to trace. We are still trying to identify and find ways to be able to do that because I I would love so much. All of us have this dream of, you know, a paper gets published and you could get a ping directly. Like, hey, your observations that you submitted are part of this study. Um, it's just not quite possible yet, but it is part of the dream. So stay tuned. All right. Any other questions? Feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A. Just looking back through, I don't see any questions. We had a lot of people in the chat. Um, it might not have gone out to everybody, but talking about all the, the phenology activity they've been seeing. And then a couple of people were talking about how they're they're now getting really cool temperatures, um, cold snaps, even though things are already active. Ugh, that'll be, that's a problem. We didn't talk about that much, but that can definitely be a problem because not so often plants are frost tolerant until they start putting on their tender spring vegetation, and then all of a sudden they are not. All right, well, we can go ahead and wrap up then. But thanks again, everyone, for being here. And um, I hope to see you in some of our other webinars throughout the rest of the week. Um, and thanks again for all you do and all the data that you collect for Nature's Notebook. Thank you. Okay.